So, topic, Uganda is oil, not yet in pipeline. That's what a, a whole lot of people in Uganda are saying. They're extremely anxious. We shall see why they're a bit more anxious than we thought. Okay, there, the introduction outline. Quite obvious, we're going to go through that very quickly. And we'll say this, that when African countries discover oil, anywhere in Africa, or maybe anywhere in developing countries today, there are four things that keep coming up in the debate. The first one is you tell them, you know, you're going to have oil, but it's going to cause all sorts of problems. And what do they say? No, we know so much about the oil all these problems, so the, we are going to resolve them. There will be no problem. Okay, and then we say, how are you going to use the revenues? Oh yeah, we will use the revenues very well because we know all about these problems. We shall even consider future generations, so no problem. So, and then people say, but all these countries that have received oil don't tend to grow as fast as you think. Maybe there's going to be a problem there. I say, no, 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 there's be no problem. And then, what about the environment? So, even there, so many lessons that we have. So, there'll be no problems. So, no problem, no problem, no problem. Everybody is looking at the price of oil. The benefits are not the costs of these things. So, I'm going to give you examples, again, very quickly, of Uganda. And we are going to use Uganda as an interesting case study of whether some of these hopes are feasible in a low-income country. So very quickly, today you have the debate about oil in Uganda. It's been on for the last 20 years, but actually the story is much, much longer. Maybe 100 years ago, uh, there were oil seepages in the western part of the country in the 1920s. But Uganda had at that time been designated as an agricultural economy, and then you had World War II coming in between, and then you had the World War, uh, rather independence and so on. So nobody quite thought about oil. Until your worthy Museveni, that many of you have heard about, became president. So as a, his, he loves a dramatic. So in 2006, 44 years after independence, he then announced that, oh, Uganda has discovered oil, and, uh, but that was 16 years ago. And oil, not yet in pipeline. Um, we had a seminar when I, was, uh, when I was working at the ADB in 2009. It was opened by President Museveni. He had gone to our President Kaberuka at the time and asked him for help. What do we do with the oil? So we went to a big, <coughs> excuse me, a big team to Kampala. And the quote of the day was quite interesting. You, you can read it there, so I won't repeat the whole of it. But it said something like this. It said, you Ugandans, I will not allow you to use my oil to go to Dubai and import perfume. I'm going to use this oil to develop Uganda. So obviously, the intentions were right but maybe practice has been quite difficult. So, Uganda has been very controversial with regard to oil uh, for a host of reasons. And there had to be what I, I want to call the coalition of the willing, uh, because there were a lot of opposing sources, some right, some wrong. But imagine a small country without any other support and so on. It has oil. The temptations are incredible. You can argue about environment, you can argue about corruption and so on, but the prize is so attractive that uh, it has been very, very difficult to keep away. But Uganda and countries like that have been co called the Cinderella's of, of the oil economy because they've come very late to the game. And it might be possible that they will not be able to dance with the prince and might not have the benefit. So the coalition of the willing has included government of Uganda, obviously, has included total E and P for a whole lot of, uh, maybe we shouldn't go into that, but anyway, for a whole lot of pol international political reasons. And China, National Offshore Oil Corporation has been very important as well. But there have been also smaller, mid-sized companies like um, uh, Hardman Resources of uh, Australia, 
uh, Tolo of, of Great Britain and Heritage Oil of the United States. There's also been geopolitical things going on, like the, the conflicts in the, uh, around the area where oil has been discovered, the DRC, but also where to, how to evacuate the oil. Do we take it through Kenya, northern Kenya? That would have been the easiest probably because it's empty up there. But guess what? It's very close to Somalia and all the implications of that could have blown out these things. But then there was also a very attractive proposition of taking the oil through northern Tanzania because Tanzania happens to own all the land. So it just dictated the arch. So it was a little cheaper and maybe faster. So the oil would be coming through Tanzania to the sea. And there have been sort of institutional things happening along the way. Again, the dynamics of political economy. And um, there have been issues already. I tell people it's a very interesting case study because even before a single liter of oil has been exported out of Uganda, all the issues of political economy, corruption, institutional erosion, and revenue dispersion, and Dutch disease have actually can be documented in Uganda. So a very interesting case. You don't have to have any oil to get all these disruptions happening. And then there's been the debate about the environment, the net zero challenges. And those are very serious issues. But I'd like to invite you, some of you that are interested, to superimpose the, those on the needs of these countries. Because, I mean, unless you can say, take care of the net zero, take care of the environment, because we have X amount of money to give you to do the things that you want to do. And nobody has that kind of money at all. So there is definitely uh, a very strong uh, uh, debate going on. Uh, it's called in Kenya, <coughs> excuse me, the Mukate politics. Mukate is bread. So bread politics is taking on quite a, quite a turn in these countries. But I must say, as I said, oil was discovered a long time ago. It's now over 20, almost 20 years ago. There's been a blessing in disguise of the delay. Why? It has helped the country to develop some institutions. It has helped the country to develop oil policy. And it has also helped the country to get off. Uh, President Museveni was saying, you Ugandans, I will not allow a single barrel of oil to leave this, this Uganda without it being sort of value addition. I will export petrol, not oil. I mean, you know, you don't have the technology. You don't have the resources. Now he agrees that maybe he should export a little bit crude so you get money to actually build a refinery and so on. So the long delay has really helped to get things going. So how many minutes now, 10? How have you used what? OK, for, for the rest of the 10, uh, minutes that I have, I want to look at some of the policy things that are happening. I'm, I'm doing this extremely fast. So revenues, politics, and the environment, the kind of dynamic up there. So as I said, even before a single barrel of oil has gone to the market, a whole lot of money in billions has come into Uganda in terms of licenses, investments, Speculators bring in money. Today in Kampala, those of you that have visited, there is a visible real estate boom in the country. People have upgraded to SUVs and Mercedes-Benzes, of course, being driven around. There's a lot of loose money around town, and land prices have gone up in Kampala, but also in the, in the theaters of oil production. And there have been running battles between parliament and the rest of government on how to allocate these funds. Uh, I'll tell you a long story. Uh, it started out by saying, let's create a fund, put money in this fund. And for future generations for building this and that, and it was agreed nationally, and it was wonderful. So they did put money, about a half, half a billion dollars in one of these funds. But guess what? 
And this is an example that repeats itself all over. When you have half a billion dollars put away, at the same time you are accumulating debt, maybe expensive debt, from China and other places, everybody will be asking, what happened? We have money in some corner, and then we're borrowing all this expensive money. Why don't we? And very quickly, that money is then brought in. So today, Uganda doesn't have a single cent left. Said, so, oh, no, don't worry. Once we produce oil, we are going to replace it. And we're going to find ways around it. And that really never happens. So there have been charges of displacement of poor people, uh, discretion of uh, ancestral lands. There's been environmental degradation already. So the debate is very, very live indeed. And of course, those of you that are not a bit of Uganda, Western Uganda is what they call a global diversity hotspot with a lot of animal fauna and plant fauna and so on. And those might be threatened by by the developments there. So a whole interesting debate going on. So let me very, very quickly uh, tell you again about how expectations have arisen and how they've been managed <coughs> or mismanaged. The first one is a welfare boost. There's not a single country, and in fact, that's the driver. There's not a single country that does not get excited when they hear about go gas coming in or oil and so on. In the case of of Uganda, I've told you about the expectations of some black sheikhs rising up in Western, in uh, Hoima, which is the local town there, becoming the Dubai of Uganda, and, uh, and so on. And um, today, about 10, country, uh, 10 small towns have been elevated to cities in Kampala. So they have cities all over, cities in quotes. But, the idea is that uh, they will be developed through oil, so they become cities. So it becomes a much, much expansive and very interesting uh, uh, expectations to boost welfare. The next one is about jobs. There is an expectation, again, that with all this oil, there will be a lot of uh, technical. A lot of countries in Africa, like technicians, that oil will bring engineers, chemical engineers, petrophysics, operations, project experts, and so on, commercial, crude exporting, really create a middle class that is so critical for the development and sustainability of economies. And there will be, of course, environmental and health and safety needs. So not just oil, but also what oil can bring in terms of, of uh, uh, capacities in the country. And then, of course, there is a broader regional politics that I've touched on. Uh, Uganda hoping that uh, East Africa can be a captive market for its oil. It's very close and, and so on. And um, by the problems, of course, uh, Uganda is completely landlocked. The oil that it has has a problem that is waxy. And that means that it has to be heated every I don't quite remember now, maybe 500 kilometers is a station that heats it up so it can, be, it can flow freely. That's going to be expensive and less competitive than other places. Uh, and then, of course, there's competition because Uganda has discovered oil. But guess what? South Sudan has even more oil than Uganda next door. So what do you do? Do you collaborate or do you compete? So those kind of issues are rising up as well. Now I'd like to conclude in the last uh, five minutes. I've been taking my own uh, uh, sort of assets. OK, so I want to conclude. Uh, and of course, by the way, all these things are now available in the paper that is on the website, those of you that are interested. But very quickly, I would say that the most important is when you have this boom that comes in, you really must agree national priorities and protect them from political expediency. Now, what normally happens is that these countries have national development plans, and that is the easiest way of getting national priorities put together. But what happens? When a bit of money comes up, they say, no, this is, they create something even bigger. So national priorities must be uh, preserved. They must demonstrate social responsibility. 
not only for the rest of the government, but also for where the money, uh, where the oil is coming from. Uh, don't forget the non-oil sectors in Uganda, it's agriculture, of course, manufacturing, uh, void Dutch disease. Think about future generations. It doesn't matter if this generation is somehow rich for five, ten years, and then you go into poverty, like has happened in many places. Try to protect the future generations as well. I like the way Norway thinks about it. The, the way I understand it, the philosophy is that uh, if you cannot ensure that what you are extracting from the ground produces enough profit for future generations to prosper, even this one and future generations, and keep it in the ground. Don't move it. Uh, very few countries have been able to really adapt that philosophy. And the environment must be protected, obviously, with all the implications, and create domestic capacities and enhance human resources. Now, I have a few other things that you can see in the blue, which you can read on your own, but I thought those six were the key implications of my presentation. It's still morning, this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you.